Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Finding Common Battlegrounds. I'm here with our uh, two discussants, uh, Nate and Tom Triplett. And uh, lately, I've been asking you guys just like a, a random question to help our our listeners get to know you a little bit better. Um, oh, let's try this because we were talking about it because I'm in Florida, not trying to bring up Florida politics right now, but you guys are in Utah. Um, favorite season in Utah? Uh, fall by far. Fall's the best. Yeah. Why? Not, Why not too hot. It's just fun. And the, you know, there's, there's Halloween and then the leaves and all the stuff. It's that's the best season for sure. Yeah. Nate? I'm also spring and fall, but I think I lean fall as well. It's just like something about getting up in the mountains in the fall when it starts getting a little starts getting yeah. a little cold and oh the crisp. Yeah, that little yeah. crisp edge to it. Mm. I love it. I could I could spend every weekend up in the mountains when it's fall. Gotcha. So two fall lovers. Um yeah, we uh here in Florida, it was weird. The first time, you know, when I first moved down here, 2007, so it's been a while. Um, I moved here in June. We have, le- you know, trees, deciduous trees in, in our yard, and they kept their leaves all the way through what would be the fall. And I was like, this is super weird. When when are the leaves going to, like, fall, <laughs> right? Like, they're supposed to fall. Uh, we make it through December. Leaves are still up all the way through to basically the end of February, first part of March. And then in the course of a week, all of the leaves turn brown, so no pretty colors. They drop, and new leaves have grown in in about a week. So yeah. in the middle of your winter, I'm raking leaves in my yard. That's interesting. Yeah. It's so we don't short get a fall. period, huh? Yeah, yeah it, it is. It's like a like one-week period. Everything drops, and everything's grown back. So I don't get fall anymore. No fall. Yeah, I like having the four seasons, but I could definitely do another month of fall and a month less of winter. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Quick shout out to our sponsor, Lux Bidets. Uh, if you don't have a bidet, you should definitely get a Lux Bidet. They're amazing. Um, okay. So we do have two topics um, tonight. Just a quick reminder for our listeners of the format. Uh, we've switched things up since uh, previous seasons. Basically, both our uh, discussants are going to critique a topic. And we have one topic that kind of critiques conservatives and one that cont- critiques progressives. Um, And I'm going to start with the critique of conservatives tonight. Um, It's been in the news. Uh, Lots of people are kind of poking fun of this because it's it's kind of shocking at this point. But uh, so our our first question, uh, and I I don't know who I'm going to pick to go first, but our, our first question is, how is it acceptable for a pathological liar like George Santos to retain his house seat? Uh, who wants to start? I can go start. for it. Okay. Do it, Tom. No. All right. Oh, All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Am I going or no? Yeah, yeah. Go, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so George Santos. So I actually was going to look this up, and I forgot. what does Which state does he represent? He's in New York. New York. So he is a New Yorker. Okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's so clearly telling the truth is not a requirement to be in Congress. That is <laughs> that is not a uh uh yeah, that's not something you you have to pass. And, and it's not something like, oh, you told a lie, you're out, right? Um and we didn't know if, that until now. <laughs> well, because if we did, yeah, we we there was a lot of we have a long uh you know trail of bodies that would have uh been created through through this process because there is no process um because yeah he's voted in and like you know there's like this pressure that's going on and stuff like that and you know you know would he resign or something like that i think the gop can like the the party could um vote against him and i but i'm not sure if they can actually even do anything they can censure him right but like i'm not sure like if they could actually do anything but but um but that aside Mm -hmm. right he's uh yeah, I because I, I was looking this up, you know, he's fabricated stuff about his 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 parents were in or his, his mom was in 9-11. Were, yeah. Oh, his, his grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust. Yes. Uh which they were yeah. not. <laughs> I didn't hear about the 9-11. Uh, I his mom, keep up with yeah. them at this point. His mom There's apparently so died in the towers, right? And, or actually she <laughs> survived the towers. She escaped and then got cancer and died from it, but she was actually in Brazil when 9-11 happened, so clearly didn't happen. <laughs> It's yeah. almost comical, like, <laughs> the, uh, so it's kind of weird, like, that they didn't that and not this kind of surfaced after he got elected, so that's kind yeah. of 
Um, Cause usually people will call this out beforehand, but like, it's, it's interesting because it's like, um, you know, Trump said crazy stuff, right. Yep. All the time. And uh, Biden has a whole bunch of stuff that he said, like he said, he was rested in the civil rights movement. He said he used to drive an 18 wheeler never has. Right. He said he was, uh, he used to go to a the Tree of Life synagogue. Used to attend there. It's a Jewish synagogue, and the rabbi's like, "No, he never went there." And uh, just he he says stuff, and like you could be like, "Oh, that's just it's trivial, right?" Or whatever, right? It's I I you know I don't know, right? It's like I don't like people not lying. It, like the, the here's my perspective on it. Yeah, they're all a bunch of liars, right? It's like <laughs> you're right. Um, I don't know. Right. Like what is the, ego? yeah, I, I would be, uh, I, if I was a voter there, I'd be upset. And I don't know I w- if I had voted or donated to him. Right. I'd be, I'd be upset, but like, I don't even know what is it, it, what, what's the recourse. You know, if he's like, Nope, I'm in, you're like, okay. It just makes the party look bad, I guess. So. Yeah. Interesting. Know, that's, so, that's all I got. Okay. Uh, I mean, the house could choose to, not seat him right so they they very well they could, could but it wouldn't be the house yeah expel him as well yeah mccarthy so can. okay so yeah so if they get enough votes right. yeah the if they house, have enough yeah, votes so- the house could choose to just remove him from office hmm. but i mean that's that's a pretty extreme measure, it has to right? be two-thirds of the of the house yeah. which getting two-thirds of the house to agree on anything is it's really right. almost impossible yeah. right now. Just right. About. Yeah. I mean, he seems to have gotten a, a considerable amount of criticism from the Republicans. And I'm sure mm-hmm. the Democrats will be like, yeah, yeah, we're all for it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'd be, I'm sure they'd be happy to get rid of him. Of course, one of the factors, and I'm not uh, trying to take this from Nate here, right? But one of the factors that I think is keeping him in in his seat is that the majority of, you know, the majority that the Republicans have is so slim that mm-hmm. they kind of need him. Right. So they're not going to censure a member of their yeah. party because they need him to maintain their slim majority in the House. I mean, they so I think that contributes to it. Yeah. Hard enough time getting McCarthy to be speaker with his vote. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. not, not okay. much they're going to do about that. So, I think. so quick recap of Tom's point. Um, he's basically saying they're all liars. Uh, George Santos is just lying about ridiculous things. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think it's obviously to like a, a whole different level, right? He's a magnitude more yes. <laughs> insane yeah. in his it's line. Like a serial right? liar. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to disagree with the point that like politicians aren't known for their honesty. I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw that out there. Okay. Nate, your take on this. I can't decide if I love the guy or if I hate the guy (laughs) because on one hand, of course I hate the guy. I'm like, you got elected under false pretenses. You lied to your constituency and your constituency decided to vote for you. How are you allowed to hold a position of power in, in, in Congress? If the fundamental facts about yourself were a complete lie and that's what got you elected into office. But the other part of me kind of loves it because I think it really just like, blows a hole in the whole operation right of like there is literally no accountability for our our congress members um you know i was looking up before we jumped on the call of okay so what how bad does it need to get to expel him from congress and i hadn't realized in the entire 150 years almost 200 years of well actually 200 plus years, 200 years. Of how yep. long congress has been uh, has existed only 15 representatives in Congress uh, have expelled members. So, and the, and the last time someone was actually expelled was in uh, 1862. Wow. And that was 14 of the 15 because they belonged to the Confederacy at the time. Oh, wow. And that's why they were expelled from Congress. Well, so, yeah, it's this idea of like, well, the people voted me in, right? You guys have, yeah. you, Congress have nothing to do with it. But then you could like argue, well, well, you got in under false advertising, right? The exactly. False pretense. And, you know, like, I don't know, there's there's not really a process for this uh, that was like there the is, Constitution. There is. Right? Well, there there is. There's Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution provides that two thirds of Congress expel a member of their, either the house or the Senate. Right. Um, 
I'm just saying, I mean, you get two thirds of Congress, you can do almost anything, right? Yeah, That's what I'm saying. Like you can pass um, uh, pretty um, substantial and, legislation. And yes. So like, yeah. I think, so it's like, yeah, sure you can. You can go to war. You can do anything. So I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> looking I mean, two thirds of Congress. Yeah. Anyway, and, and looking sorry. at the history of this, I see like most, if for the most part, when somebody's in and hot enough water that they would be expelled, they usually resign. So there are plenty of members who have resigned because they've right. either been caught, yes. you know, committing they a get, crime get or pressured. corruption or whatever it is, right? And so they get pressured no, and they resign. There's so the, I'm watching this video and there's this reporter who's like, "How do you feel about the lies?" Blah, blah, blah. And he's like walking, you know, they they kind of tried to corner him, and he's just like. I don't think, you know, people are calling my office and we reply and da, 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 da. It's like, he doesn't care. He doesn't <laughs> care at all. I'm just like, okay. Like, it's kind of, that's, it, it almost makes me laugh too. Like you were saying, Nathan, I'm just like, all right, he's rolling and, with it. And so part of me for a moment was like, okay, is this guy just like, is he trying to prove a point here? Is he trying, like, I almost, there was almost a level of respect there for a moment of like, maybe this guy is trying to prove a point of like, I can just say whatever I want and get into Congress. But I think he's actually just a sociopath or psychological liar and maybe a little bit of a sociopath. Like, I just don't think that he, he cares. Hmm. Did you see this? Did you see the Dave Chappelle SNL opening a few weeks ago? Mm Mm-hmm. I did. You I did. Had a it. very long monologue. It was like fifteen yeah, minutes yes, long. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it is awesome. It was pretty it good. Is so good, and he basically it's awesome because he talks about Trump and why why Trump isn't 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 easily <laughs> defeated. And but the party goes on about it. He's like he's like because the moment he's like the moment people he knew like Trump was gonna like go for it was when they I guess there was a debate and they were talking about the tax code and they were talking about like well you know, do you use these loopholes in the tax code? And he's like, oh yeah, I lo- I use the loopholes. That makes me smart. And he's like, and guess what? All of us rich people use the tax codes, and, you know, and this is like what he did. And, but James Chappelle's like recounting it and everyone's just like, hold, you know, he was like, I was watching that going, holy crap. And he's like, it's basically like the guy, you know, there's this elite building and one mm-hmm. guy comes out and he's like, Yes, we're doing all the things you think we're doing in this building. And then he goes back in and keeps doing it. And I was like, it's so good. It was so such a good monologue of like just going on about just corruption and politics. I was just like, it's because it's like he's like he was so he's so honest that, about like all of his corruption that that it's almost like you can't like what do you do with it? Right? Yeah, how do you create critique it when he admits it? Yeah, I I think and that's this is... and that's what I feel like. It's like that's where he's like, yeah, I'm just rolling with this. You know, <laughs> I think this is like kind of bringing it back to the more political aspect of. I think this is the fundamental issue that the the Republican Party is going to face right now is they've gone so far right with the introduction of Donald Trump, and they've got two sections of essentially re- the Republican Party. They have yeah. the the more centrist conservative republicans and then you've got the alt-right whack job republicans maga republicans and we're seeing more and more fringe republicans come into congress and come into power that are are one kind of splitting the party and i think i think the republican party is is going to have to reconcile with that at some point and then two 2024 we will right because we're gonna have to deal with it does does trump become the nominee or not again right and i mean you're gonna see that already with a desantis trump runoff as far as the presidency but i mean we're seeing this specifically with multiple members of congress who just should not be holding seats matt gates being a perfect example of florida (laughs) um who is under investigation by the fbi for sex crimes against children and uh is still holding a seat in congress um and is i mean there's there's a I name off a, a dozen of them, Marley Ta- or Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has no business being in con- uh, in Congress in the House, and she's still retaining her seat. But again, the parties have to hold on to power, and so Kevin McCarthy, for example, is not going to push to expel any of these members because one, then the, the Republicans lose their majority, and he needs these members' votes to even get his seat in the first place. Yeah, so I don't know. It's it's, it's a whole totally mess. That... Game. It's totally the game, and that's the and 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 it goes both ways, right? You got people. Well, on not the other side. really though, you have because like, here's you have like the, the thing: squad they're making like openly anti-Semitic comments, right? And like 
because one of them's um she's Muslim, Muslim. Right? and 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 she's just like unapologetic about it and it's just like well, what what okay. would you say that uh we're gonna go off the rails here but uh what would you say that uh ilhan, ilhan omar said that was uh anti-semitic what what did she say mm-hmm. um i don't know uh, the exact comments yeah. but, but I, I remember up. watching it and and i did agree that they were pretty they were anti-semitic they were i mean what she was talking about is is israel's uh actions against palestinians which i would 100 percent agree with so i would sure, i would i, I would vehemently I disagree that Ilhan Omar said i think she was saying something like they should be eliminated or something like that i think it was pretty um uh aggressive but talk. i'd be happy but to like, chat about that um because I, like, I i don't think it's equal and that's that's where i'm going to come down to is you may have elected officials on in each party who have said things or done things that probably they shouldn't in a, in a position of power. Right. But there is one party who's egregiously doing this across the board compared to the other. Um, and I'm perfectly on board with holding both parties and all, all Congress people accountable to their actions. But uh, especially on the right, I mean, you've got, you've got sitting, um, let's see, I I don't know the example off the top of my head, so I won't bring it up, but you've got multiple members of the House who were also investigated in part of the January 6th insurrection. So, like I said, the the two sides, I don't don't really feel like the both sides argument works in this scenario. Uh, I I completely disagree. I mean, like, I can churn up plenty of stuff that I think is even more great. Like, the, I think the whole Twitter scandal thing with Biden administration shutting down a shadow banning and shutting down uh, uh, accounts is an egregious violation of the, of the First Amendment. And there was even senators saying, like, isn't this a violation of the First Amendment? Like Democratic senators that were that were like, there was well, there was one there was one that questioned it saying, like, should we be doing this? And like, and but openly doing it like that. To me, that's like that's the foundation of democracy, and uh, and I think extremely concerning. And I'm extremely concerned with how much how comfortable the democratic is with that. And so it's like you could say, oh, well, you're worse than that. They're both really bad, right? They're both really bad, and like that's I don't agree rampant, with that. There's rampant corrupt. Well, that's the <clears throat> pro- this is I will go yeah. on and on about this because like it's you because it's it's the oh my side's better than yours, you know, or you know, mm-hmm. I know it's uh. Well, if you I think it's silly if you can't see both sides like that, it's really bad on both sides, uh, like to, or that's to, not say, like or mine's not as bad. Right. It's like, well, well, that's not what I'm arguing. Right. Because the, the Democrats don't have any elected Congress people who are. Literal fascists. I mean, we've got multiple Republicans who are right on the verge of of being open fascists at this point who are pro the uh, the January 6th insurrection have uh, said multiple turn like uh, statements of support against the January 6th insurrection. You've got people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's one of the worst examples, in my opinion, of who will just say blatantly false, really dangerous things about COVID or Jewish space labor lasers or, um, you know, uh, election denial and, and, uh, the integrity of our our democracy. So, to would I ever say that the Democrats don't lie? Absolutely not. I think that the Democrats should be just as held just as accountable as the Republicans. But to say that the to to say as they are as corrupt as the the Republicans at the moment, well, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Well, so corruption refers to something very specific, right? And and that's where I think I would I would step in because I was actually just looking up of like, ooh, you know. Uh, sure. Names of people of, who have resigned from Congress because they were under investigation for corruption scandals. And this first list gave like an even split of Democrats and Republicans, right? So uh, as far as like literally taking money for bribes, that sure. kind of corruption, corruption might have been the wrong word. There, yeah, but. I don't think corruption is the right word. I think uh, what you might be trying to suggest is like, a, a bit of radicalization and disconnect from reality. Maybe there's, you know, some difference there. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's a tricky one because it's also a matter of perspective and, and relativity, right? So I think Tom would go just the other way and say like, oh, there are plenty of far left-leaning Democrats who want these radical policies, right? 
and you wouldn't see it that way uh, because sure. in part that's where you are, right? You're on that side. Whereas yeah. from your perspective, you the see Green New the Green New Deal's a really radical, crazy right. policy, and then you know the well, Republicans are like, "Hey, let's take people, immigrants, and just." dump them out on the other edge of the border and kill them. <laughs> right. Uh, which, and, you know, which from they're Tom's doing. perspective, he would see it differently. Sorry. I've got a wasp in my room right now. Get I'm going to kill thing, it. Man. Get it. Oh, ah. I think I got it. Oh, that's a new we, one. We don't have, we have that, that happen on the right podcast now. before. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How is this wasp in my office? This is crazy. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. I, I I think you're totally right, Ryan, in that they there would be, yeah, things that huh. you think are benign, Nathan. I would think are a tremendous threat to the country, and 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 in which would I would see them as radical leftists. What, yeah. Right. Exactly. Which, sure. Uh, I would oppose against what what you're saying, and I I yeah, like tit for tat like can we come down and be like oh someone's a nose ahead that's where i think it is i don't think i don't see an egregious like oh someone's um i mean i am you know there are things that i was concerned about with with january 6 but uh uh there were there were but there were definitely some um to you know there there was some um people took some liberties with like Trump's, you know, place. Oh, he was orchestrating this whole thing. Da, 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 da. I'm like, there's, there's a lot of evidence to say that he was not. And I'm like, so I'm like, I, I don't, I don't buy that. There's this grand thing. Are they both bad? That, that's where I put them. I'm like, they're both bad. Um, that's I. Think and I won't disagree with that. I don't think anybody's going to disagree that both parties have a lot of issues, and nobody's happy with our current, our, <laughs> our, our current representation, and whether it be yeah. our local legislation, whether it be. Uh, in Congress or whether it be a uh, more, more executive branch. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. And I'll, I like, I'm, I always beat this thing to death is this whole, like, cause um, I remember it was, it was, I was talking with family. I think it was your, your father, actually, my brother was uh, talking to me and he was like up in arms about, it was um, uh, Supreme court nominees during. Um, and so during Obama years, the Republicans wanted to wait for the new president. Right. Mm -hmm. And then during Trump, they flip flopped and and they were like, yep. no, no, let's get it through right now. And he was going on about it like, and they can, and then they flip flopped and he's going on the whoever the speaker was and he was like, I can't believe it. And I'm like, but you understand the Democrats flip flopped too, completely flip flop, right? And on and it's all like, well, sure, morally, absolutely, this is better. And like, they just want to stay in power. They just want their guys in power. Holy mm -hmm. cow! But he was like saying, I can't believe the Republicans did it. And you're like, but but they, the other team flip flopped 100, did a 180 as well. So I'm like, you can't call out one without calling out the other. It's just like, you know. Yeah. But we see, we well, see what we want to see. <laughs> And so, of course, okay. and and like I said, I won't disagree. I won't disagree that that both sides flip flop, and both sides will do whatever it takes to to try um, and retain whatever power. it takes, but try and retain power as much yeah. as possible. Mm -hmm. My argument being, what's happening, what Republicans are okay with their sitting members of Congress doing and saying, versus what Democrats have done, I don't think is equal. You're, you're saying I, it's. I, I would use okay. I would use an example of like. Both two Republican governors, both Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis, both herding up essentially immigrants, putting them on buses, and then busing them to Kamala Harris's house and dropping them off to prove a point, which is something right. they've both done multiple times to prove a point. Yeah. In this scenario, they're taking people who human beings, putting them on a bus, not telling them that where they're going, and then dropping them off somewhere else to prove a political stunt. That's not only dangerous, um, violent, especially if these people don't have a, a way of feeding themselves, of taking care of themselves, and just being dropped off in the middle of nowhere for somebody else to deal with. You don't see acts like that happening from the Democrats, where we're, we're, there's a blatant disregard for life um, and people in the name of a political stunt. I won't argue that the Democrats don't think do things that are wrong all the time. I'm I'm about to attack the Biden administration on our next point for uh, their aid to Ukraine, but I don't think that you can say that these two sides are equal. And that's just one example that of, of um, a multitude. I, th I think we could chat about. 
Um, okay, so I, I want to I want to loop this back one to George Santos, but I, I'm wondering if, um, yeah, and you know, our listeners I think are aware that I, I lean to the left, right? I'm trying to be you know the 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 moderator here, but I wonder if, and you guys can both kind of opine on this, because Republicans are effectively, I mean, they were in the minority, right? Literally elected wise, but if you look as far as Republican support across the country, they have less support than Democrats do. And then there's a sizable middle segment, right? The independents who kind of swing. So I wonder if, just hypothesis here, part of the reason why you might have a small, maybe a small, you know, Tom said like a slight nose advantage, right? The Republicans might be a little bit more wackadoodle right now is precisely because they are in the minority. And so they're willing to keep the more objectionable members of their party in power because they can't afford to lose anybody, right? So your Marjorie Taylor Greens, who she does say some really crazy stuff, right? Like just out of the, like not in touch with reality level stuff. Um, and, and so that's kind of a question for the two of you, right? Are, could it be the case if we're balancing this out of like, okay, Democrats do some crazy stuff. Republicans do some crazy stuff. Could it be the case that Republicans are maybe slightly more crazy right now? And it's because they are in fact in the minority and they're just like, we cannot afford to kick anybody out because if we do, we could lose that seat. I don't know, Tom, your I, thoughts. I would, I wouldn't even say it's, they can't afford it's, it gives, um, uh, the polarization gives you a bigger power, right? It's this, um, there's this whole oh, interesting thought. The there was this great article I read about the guy I can't remember his name, but he said um, it was during Obama's State of the Union speech, and he yelled and he said, "Liar!" Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I remember. And that. you remember that? Yeah. And I can't. I think his name was Joe. Joe something. And anyway, he got so much money immediately within the next twenty four hours. He got a ton of money for um for that, right? And it's just like he he. He basically kind of branded himself as this like firebrand, and and uh, and it was like, and everyone wanted that guy. They and and that's why Trump caught in, right? Like they, they want a fighter, and that kind of polarization brings in your it brings in a lot of passion, a lot of money. Um, that's that's why. Um, and, and we're seeing that further. We're seeing it on the left and the right. And yes, we, Trump was this in crazy mm -hmm. departure from our typical thing. And we're the party's still dealing with that. And uh, uh, and I, you know, and there's a lot of people that have fatigue because they're like, that was a little too far. Right. Uh, but like, we're going to be dealing with that. And then, like I said, it's going to come up and we're going to deal with it in the next two years. And Trump might be the candidate. Right. And uh, yeah. and th there's a very there's a decent chance that he especially if things like if the economy takes a hard turn south oh yeah he'll be he'll be the candidate um interesting and uh so like it's that's just the way the politics you know our politics are right now it's that it's that hmm. polarization that brings it down easier the more money they get man it's like yeah. so that was joe the wilson base. i looked him up it was joe, joe wilson. wilson yeah, yeah from joe. from south hmm. carolina um so I, I think that's an interesting twist on the point that I was making that maybe it's not so much that they're willing to kind of accept these people by allowing a fringe and then kind of more of the mainstream, all of that spectrum in the Republican Party, they actually have a greater appeal to more people, right? So they've broadened their appeal sure. by allowing the fringe and all the way up to like the centrist mm -hmm. Republicans. That's an, that's an interesting point. I like that point. I, I think that's a good way to think about it. Nate, your thoughts on that point, and then we we should move on to the next one. Yeah, I mean, I I think I'd agree with that for the most part. I, I you can only you the Republicans can't go any far any further left. They can only go further right. The Democrats have a lot of room. They can move further well, further right and left, right? Because there's a big, well, in my opinion, in, in the in the United States, the Democrats are conservatives. If you're looking at it, I brought this up on previous versions of the podcast, but uh, on a political spectrum, like there are, there's not a, a large progressive representation in Congress currently. There are progressive members of Congress, but there's not a very large progressive uh, representation within Congress in general. And so I think there's a lot more room to move left for the Democrats than there is for uh, the Republicans to move right, if that makes sense. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. Okay, and then wrapping up on on George Santos. So it sounds like we've got a, a couple of points here, which I think are kind of interesting. Uh, first, I think there's general agreement between the two of you that uh, politicians are not known for their honesty. So George Santos, yes, he stands out, but um, I'm trying to think, right? Like it's, if if all politicians were like, tan right i'm just trying using colors george santos is kind of like a darker brown right like they're they're all they're all kind of you know the same stripe here he's just standing out a little bit right uh and then the other one that i thought was actually clean hands there yeah there are no clean hands here um i i do wonder now like this is going off of nate's point is george santos just like the ultimate troll right like he knows exactly what he's doing he's just punking us all and he's doing this for some reason you know he's got like some (laughs) you know, big uh, contract with some, I don't know, Hollywood mogul, right? They're like, they're going to make a movie about how you can just lie your way into Congress, right? Like he's got a book contract all set up and this is all a plan. Like he just did this. It's like Joaquin Phoenix's uh, promo he did for like a year where he got on like Jay Letterman (laughs) and it was like, and just total douchebag. And it was all part of his like role for a movie, right? Yes. uh, (laughs) That's that's what he's going to be like, just kidding. I definitely gotcha. had that thought for the first little while, but there's uh, just, it's continually, conti- there's more information that continues to surprise us about more lies from when, and things that are uncovered about George Santos that I'm like, I don't think that you could purposely make this up this well, because it's just absolutely insane of how much he's lied about and how much they continue to uncover just crazy things in his past. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it would be, like it would be super impressive if he was just punking us all. I right? kind of like, love it. I, it, it, it would I be wish. great, right? At the end of the day, if he's just like, "Ha ha, yeah, I knew I was lying the whole time," and I it did would it restore for, you know, to a little bit book. of faith in our system, I think, but and in humanity. But no, not right now. Okay, let's move on to our next topic. So, second topic. Uh, this is the critique of the left here. A um, little bit of background, but so the basic question: How is it problematic for the Biden administration to agree to send modern tanks to Ukraine? So for those who haven't been paying attention, I mean, obviously, Ukraine has been invaded by Russia, but just recently, Germany and the US, under, I think, a fair amount of pressure from other NATO allies, have finally conceded that they're going to send tanks. Uh, Poland was basically on the verge of sending the tanks that they have that are that are German tanks. They were like, we're going to send it whether Germany says yes or no, right? Like they were just ready to do it. Um, so they both just in the last week and a half or so have basically agreed to send modern tanks to, to Ukraine. Um, so the question is, how is this problematic? Who wants to start? Well, I'll start on that one. All right, Nate, go. So I, I think this actually ties back to my fr- my earlier point in the sense of, I do think that there are there is a lot that that I can criticize Democrats about, and I'm I'm willing to criticize Democrats about because to I think for the sake of of this podcast, sometimes you know what Ryan earlier was saying for the progressive side and instead of the Biden administration, but I wouldn't consider the Biden administration progressive in any, in any shape, way, or form. Most Democrats are very are pro on the side of of a couple of things: war, the military industrial complex. Um, the economy and growing the economy and growing capital, growing capitalism. Both parties align on this. Yes, there are plenty of polarizing issues that you know we get really heated about. But when it comes down to these more bo- boring policies, the parties are way more aligned than than most people give credit for. And so the Biden administration sending aid to Ukraine, I think, is a perfect example of no matter who is going to be the president, we might disagree with. Most of the, most people don't want us involved in, in wars, um, but we continue to fund wars overseas and be because we spend so much in uh, military spending, the American government will always be a beacon that the world looks upon for aid and all of our allies look upon for military aid whenever there is any level of geo, geopolitical com, conflict because we've established ourselves as that world power because we spend so much in military spending and there's no way we can get away from that at this point i don't believe we're con- gonna we're consistently shoehorned into when ukraine needs tanks in this scenario uh germany was considering sending i believe it was like 14 leopard tanks um and their condition to send those tanks to ukraine was if the u.s sent tanks as well and so we're kind of shoehorned into this this position of 
if we do want other European nations or other world leaders to provide aid to Ukraine, we have to kind of burden, uh, take that burden so that, you know, these smaller countries don't become the uh, target of, of Russia. So I think my point being like, no matter who's president, whether it be Trump or, or Biden, we will continue to fund wars overseas rather than pay for put more money towards things that we need here in the US. Um, we, we just continue to spend more and more and more and more um, sending tanks overseas. So I, I, I don't think that it was a good idea. I wouldn't provide, uh, I, I'm very critical of any aid that the Biden administration has provided to Ukraine at this point. I believe it's in the tune of almost 20, almost $30 billion uh, at this point between uh, from Probably the Biden more. administration to um to Ukraine. So I think I was 27 billion was the latest before I think we just sent another 500 million in tanks was what I was looking up earlier. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find it but um interesting. So it sounds like the critique here uh generally is that you see the US as like a, a warmongering country. And so that's your general critique is like, you're not a fan of this, that we're, we're basically funding war, right? Um, and you think we should be spending the money on other causes. Absolutely. It's, yeah. we've, created, we've created so much economic infrastructure around perpetual, perpetual wars overseas because our defense contractors make so much money and provide so much stability and money back into the economy because of the weapons that they build and and how much military we sp- spending uh, that we do in general, I don't think that there's a way for us to move away from that without huge economic impacts. And so, like I said, we're, we've pigeonholed ourselves into we are going to be stuck in these perpetual wars, whether it be wars happening in the Middle East, whether it be the providing aid to Ukraine. As long as we're producing weapons and exporting them. Uh, the U.S. government will continue to just stay on the same path, and I'm vehemently against that. I'm anti-war across the board. So, gotcha. Um, in 2022, the U.S. has spent uh, about 50 billion dollars in assistance to Ukraine, and that includes humanitarian, financial, and military support. So, oh, that's it's, even way it's more than I thought. Yeah, it's more okay. than you thought. I was going to say, I know it's more than 20 billion. Okay, Tom, your take. How is it problematic for the Biden administration to agree to send modern tanks to Ukraine? Yeah, I I agree with Nathan on the what do they call it the industrial military complex, right? Military that, industrial complex, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that um that that's this big behemoth that in that we're kind of like it's the thing we do um and the cog keeps turning. Uh as far as critiques, I would say like first off first off like the Democratic Party is supposed to be the make love not war party, right? And it's like um and all of a sudden you're like, it was like weird, this cultural shift, like, oh, we got to help Ukraine. They're the good guys. We got to beat the bad guys. And you're like, it's still war. Right. And you're like the whole like um, critique of the Iraqi war. Right. It was like, it was like, like we switched. It's this whole thing I talk about. We just switched sides. And it was like, we're Iraq, Iraq. We're like, we're helping, you know, the Iraqis from the dictator Saddam. And it's like, and you're like, it's still, and you know, in the left was like, well, we don't want to be to war. We shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be in here. Right. And it's like, and now it's like, oh, we got to help. We got to help Ukraine. We got to get in there. And it's this, I think it's just a slippery slope because I like that point you're making there, Tom, because I think we're in agreement in the fact that your perception of what the left is supposed to be is this make love, not war. We want to take care of people. We want to we want to Thanks. have this utopia and hippy dippy, you know, kind of mentality, but that's not what the democratic party is. And I think you make a great point of no matter who's in power, whether it's the Democrats, uh, you know, criticizing Republicans for the Iraq war, uh, back in the early two thousands in the Bush administration, or whether it's now, um, you know, the Biden administration continuing to funnel money to Ukraine, even though it's not a war we're directly involved in, we're still spending, yeah. um, People it's, are the Democratic Party is is not this left wing 
party that you think it is and that that would be my point but it, it's supposed to have been like that's their whole ideology right ideology of mercy right we're like oh we let immigrants in we're not going to kick them out we're gonna we have um welfare programs uh it's that that's that's the stuff that's the whole platform they write on so it's like i think it's Kinda. odd that we're like oh yeah and we go to war right and you're like i thought like when I, they were against the iraqi war i totally got it right it was like yeah that's your position it should be your position it's just this weird flip-flop and then and, and the republicans are i'm upset at too because they're like yeah putin's the greatest you're like what? <laughs> <laughs> like um so yeah just to have a counterpoint against the left right it's yeah. all, exactly yes yeah. and uh so the big question I would ask is um, the uh, Pax Americana, right? That's the uh, it's the idea that America is the police of the world. And mm-hmm. like, is this still the case? Is this still true? Is this still like, are we supposed to be doing this? Because it seemed like we weren't going to do this anymore. Afghanistan, Iraq, we're like, okay, we're, we're kind of getting out of this. And, uh, and you know, there's this whole, there's a whole case for deglobalization and, and, and America's not going to get involved anymore, but it's like, but we're, apparently we're jumping in. And I think, um, this is interesting because I mean, this is totally a, turning into a proxy war right now, mm-hmm. where it's like, here's the weapons, and here, you know, here's how you aim, here's how to them, use them, <laughs> here's the button you push right there. You know, it's just like, who's fighting this war? Uh, you know, and it was like, first, it was we were providing intelligence, then we were sm- providing small arms, then it was financial assistance, now we're providing tanks, right? It's just like, it's just this slope, and the, and wars have a tendency to escalate. And and more and more stuff gets involved, and we're seeing that right now. And uh, not not to mention, I was going to say, and and this was I like I read a few articles, and they brought this up too that it's like not a good look for Germany, right? You know, fighting their former, you know, the Nazis did do a, quite a bit of some atrocities over there in Ukraine, and uh, and so it's like, oh, we're going to send tanks again. And I I think I actually the article was saying Germany was really hesitant to do this and they kind of had to be pressured. And so kudos for them, I guess, right. That they were like, maybe we don't want to be doing this, but they did. And uh, so, you know, whatever there, but um, I think this is actually uh, this, this is sort of a dark black swan kind of thing that I can see happening is there's this thing. And this is from the economic standpoint, We've we've gotten bled out of wars, right? You, Afghanistan just I mean, we spent so much money trillions there, and, I, and trillions yes, of and, dollars. And in Iraq. And I mean, just destroyed us. And like in, in like the when you're Americans tech is awesome, but it is super expensive. And so like it, you know, like a guy, you know, it was like the they talked about like Iraqis were like just bleeding us dry with just like these little IEDs, right? Bombs and um, and a couple, you know, other just small weapons. Right. And, and they're doing it on a shoestring and, and we're spending, you know, trillions to, to combat them. Um, that could happen again. And like, and you know, the, the, there's a lot of worry about the debt, the amount of debt we have created. Right. And, and which hasn't been a problem for a long time because rates have been super low. Well, rates are now climbing, you know, they're almost a 5%. Our, our service cost for that debt is getting quite outraged. Um, is going to really hurt us, especially in the next few months when we're having to roll some of these debts over. Um, and so there's this whole like thing that's happening right now where China and and Russia are creating the BRICS economy. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's a commodity and gold-backed um, currency that they're trying to get other countries. And India is kind of on board with it. And uh, it's like, if we... So like, here's the scenario. Here's a crazy scenario. We're like, right now, we're not... We we're we haven't raised the debt ceiling and the US Treasury is doing extraordinary measures to make sure we pay. If they miss a payment and we lose our AAA status and like all of a sudden no one wants to buy US Treasuries, that will be a domino effect that will be like that will be incredible. Devastating. Like, yeah. Devastating. And China and Russia will basically have kicked our trash. Like they will they will be the beneficiaries of that because you know russia massive a commodity base and uh and and china's been buying up tons and tons of gold like like this could be like a evil plan that or evil uh a trap that we are falling into as an evil plan and you know and it's like i you know there's lots of conspiracy stuff like that 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 may never play out at all but like it it's not um it's not 
unforeseeable. It could happen. And like, sure. there's a lot of scenarios, like our debt is becoming a big, big problem, especially with these higher rates and inflation. So like it, it, that, you know, that's a worst case scenario, but it's like, but it, it's not good. I, <laughs> I, I do think that these. if if we get to the point where we fundamentally can't come to an agreement on anything to the fact of even raising the debt ceiling, um, I think we're more imminent danger of the, the U S falling into catastrophic catastrophic civil war before we do geopolitical war with china i don't see that happening no yeah i don't i i yeah i'm i don't know i don't know um like we do we'll do proxy wars all day i mean we're doing a proxy war war right now it's with thailand but eh. yeah i I mean i definitely agree that um so I've, Taiwan, I've read all of this. Taiwan, there's this yeah. there's this great video about how it says the U.S. is ridiculously OP, and it's like, and it's true. You read all the stuff, and we're like, we are like geographically set up in so many ways that like it, uh, things I hadn't even thought of. I was like, oh wow, yeah, that is great. Um, don't like so it's kind of like the uh, China could never beat us unless we rip ourselves apart first right we like totally cripple ourselves by like major internal turmoil right which that could totally happen um I mean, if, if, yeah if we if we get there it seemed really bad i, a little I while think ago. that seems comes like that's subsided but like down yeah. to my fundamental issue with the biden administration providing as much aid to ukraine as we have is we aren't addressing our own issues within within the united states there hasn't been any level of sweeping legislation that has fundamentally changed americans lives since trump did the stimulus checks and honestly like i don't even know if if the biden administration would do the stimulus te- checks in the same situation because of the actual backlash that the republican party would have given in in the reverse situation it's we're so concerned about making sure that the other party that the two parties fighting each other right and making sure that they don't get to do what they want to do that nothing happens we can't agree right. on any level of spending yeah. For hmm. things that actually impact day to day American lives. Um, well, I mean, just to point that out, uh, the Biden administration, right when they took power, did uh, pass another stimulus bill, right, that was worth over a trillion dollars. And then they sure. did pass the infrastructure bill, which was also worth over a trillion dollars. So they have passed a couple of big pieces of legislation, but since then, they really haven't passed anything, right? So yeah. they passed two very early on, and then now it's just kind of a quagmire. Um, okay, so I want to I want to push you guys on something. I listened to a really good podcast. Uh, uh, I don't remember if I, I listened to two primarily, right? There's uh, the Wall Street Journal podcast and the Daily. And I don't remember which one it was, but one of them was talking through why we ended up doing, you know, sending tanks. So the US decides to send tanks. And they said, you know, it's been this really interesting pattern from the beginning with Ukraine. Um, Right at the beginning, we didn't know the US and our allies, right? Not including Ukraine. We didn't know what Russia's red line is, right? Like, how much can we contribute before Russia says, eh, we're going to push the big button, right? We're going to drop a nuke on Ukraine. Mm. Um, we're going to escalate to that point, right? So we we don't know where it is. It's not like Putin's going to tell us, right? No. He's going to tell us, you know, every step of the way, oh, if you do this, that's the red line. If you do this, it's the red line. So early on, you, you know, Tom got it right. Like, we're like, oh, you know, we're, we're supporting you. We'll send food. We'll, we'll train you. We'll share intelligence, right? And then we started sending uh, small arms. And then we started sending longer ranged missiles, right? And so now we've got HIMARS there. And then we moved. And every time uh, what they were saying is the Biden administration would bring in a whole bunch of military experts and intelligence experts and say, like, okay. Is, is this too, are we pushing too far? Yes, that's exactly yeah. what it is, right? Like it, there's that discussion of if we do this, does this escalate so much that Russia then is like, no, that's it. You know, we're going to drop, you know, a nuclear bomb on Kiev or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they've, they, they keep pushing, hoping that they're not crossing the red line. Uh, But that's why it's been kind of this um, like waves of approved different, you know, advanced technologies. And that's why we just got to the most recent one. So I I thought one of you might go there, but what's your take on that? Right. Like, it, is it problematic that the Biden administration is agreeing to send modern tanks? Because that effectively tells Russia we're willing to escalate even further. Well, it's like, 
okay. The, oh, that didn't do it. Well, then let's try this. Oh, that didn't do it. Okay, well, let's try that. Right? Like, it's like, what are we doing? Right? Yes, there is that whole thing. And I, yeah, it, I didn't bring that up, but it's, uh, but that's been talked about a lot at the beginning, right? Of like, what's the line? And, and mm-hmm. Putin's the kind of guy that I think anyone could see doing this, right? Could that, you know, he gets upset. He could nuke Ukraine or nuke something else, right? And uh, do something at us. It's like, totally could. Uh, that's that. It, and it's like we're it's like we're we're flirting with that right i mean we are we are 100 percent. and like what like this is what i always say what the heck is the goal right here right is it ukraine totally you know we kick is it ukraine because like what was it um elon musk i think proposed like he was like advocating like that basically they draw a line where kind of where it's at right now. And, right. and uh, Ukraine um, seeds seeds it. territory. Yeah. yeah. And it's um, because like, what is the alternative? Ukraine gets all the, the firepower they want. They push Russia out and Russia just turns around. And like, okay, we're done. Right. And, and I know like what will happen, right. Putin will come under immense pressure, right? From, Mm -hmm. from people, from his oligarchs, right? Like, how's that going to play out? Like it could be civil war, but it could be him doing something crazy, right? It's, it's, you know, it's, he's a very, he's sort of a wild card and I I don't, I can't see it ending well with Ukraine winning. I can't see ending well with him, right? Maybe someone just assassinates him and it all works out well, but I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a zero sum game for Ukraine, and that's the problem, right? Is because like they are kind of stuck between, like I said, the U.S. and and Russia. This, that's what I mean by it's a proxy war. Of is it no matter what, Ukraine is is the one who loses here. There there is no winning because they can't push back, and they're not going to be able to push back against Russia and reclaim. Uh, the already annexed Crimea and the already annexed um uh, I can't remember the other one that, yeah, that the, has been the annexed. Donbass. Donbass. The Donbass yeah. region. The Donbass, yeah. There's only so I don't think they have the capabilities to do so without the US stepping in and providing mm-hmm. enough arms and enough money and support to actually make that a, a reality. And at that point the US is just getting involved in the war almost directly. I mean we're we're so in our soldiers, soldiers right it's not it's our, our soldiers. soldiers but that's the problem and i think that's the future of of warfare for world powers is because we are so afraid of that nuclear threat we'll, we'll we be don't sending our robots to, to i mean we don't want to go back to the cold war right we don't want to go back to who's going to launch a nuke and no one is willing to i don't think anyone is going to be willing to to let it escalate to the point we're openly declaring war on russia or china um in allowing a possibility where there is <laughs> geothermal nuclear warfare. Instead, we're going to continue to participate in these smaller proxy wars over other countries as political pawns and the people are there as political pawns to essentially just have the world superpowers just push back and forth. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think there's a, there's a winning situation for Ukraine. There may be a winning situation for Russia, there may be a winning situation for the U.S. in this scenario, but Ukraine just doesn't doesn't win no matter what. Hmm. Interesting. Um, th- the last point that I, I they brought up in this podcast that I thought was really interesting. Every time the U.S. gives them weapons, right? It's it, <clears throat> obviously Russia escalates. So Russia at one point had um, longer range artillery. So that's when we send on our high Mars, which you know, it shoots further than Russia's artillery, right? So it's like, we just up a little bit and then Russia's like, oh, we got to up, uh, you know, and, but one of the things that the U.S. keeps saying is, look, if, if it's your own weapons, Ukraine, you can actually attack Russia on Russian soil, mm-hmm. but you can't use American weapons to attack Russian soil. So you can only defense. attack, yes, you can only attack Russians on Ukrainian soil, but if you cross that border now you've crossed uh, like a line line, right? And maybe it's not the red line, but you've crossed a line to where now the Russia could effectively say the U S has in fact attacked Russia. Right. Well, I, right? I, I, I would, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I, 
would totally say that would be true. I, I can't see how the Russians wouldn't see that. So, so I, I, I thought, I mean, that podcast was really fascinating mm-hmm. to just kind of wrestle with, like, this is the logic that the Biden administration has to deal with where they think through every single time, like, Oh, Russia's getting an advantage. Well, we've got weapons that can do better than Russia's weapons. But if we give them to Ukraine uh, and then, you know, one of the things they did point out to Ukraine's credit, every time we give them weapons, there's also this discussion of like, oh, but they're not going to be able to use them, right? This is like really high technology, uh, really advanced technology. And then the Ukrainians like master it in minutes, right? There's like, we got this. And immediately they actually figure out better ways to use it than what we thought they would even be able to do with it. They're mm-hmm. really inventive, really creative. And of course, they're fighting for their homeland, right? right. So uh, that does change the dynamic at some level where it's like, no, I'm actually fighting for my people, right? My, my right. family, my country. My they're more motivated. Right there. Yes, I'm like literally. Them. Yeah, I'm protecting them. They're yeah, far I'm... more motivated than the Russians, right? So it's pretty fascinating to see. Well, and the out. Americans. Yeah. Like, uh, yes. It's not like I, Americans I in that's Iraq. A, that's, a, that's a Western attitude of, of these people aren't as smart as we are. They mm-hmm. they don't have the capabilities to use the weapons that we do, and of course they do. We saw that in the they Middle totally East do. when we started, uh, you know, arming the uh, Afghani, um, the Afghani uh, military at the po- at that time, and, and the uh, Iranian military or Iranian military. I'm trying to remember the name of that group, um, uh, and even the the Taliban as well. Is is the mm-hmm. argument was like we're not worried about American weapons falling into the hands of the Taliban because the Taliban doesn't know how to use them. And then guess what? The Taliban was using American weapons against. Americans. against the americans so yep. i yeah. think that that attitude is is a more towards an just attitude of Western video. superiority where we think mm-hmm. we're all high and mighty and we're not yeah i agree well someone i made i heard i watched a video that did say that like oh well they're slowly escalating it because there's training involved with it and they, they were saying one of the one of the tanks or something was a 41 week training program and uh and you're like yeah and so like i'm like 41 weeks i'm like that's crazy um anyway so i'm like yeah i'm like i don't believe that that's really that long and i don't believe that's actually the reason right like well, that's why we're slow rolling all this stuff mm-hmm. you're like no i think we're just escalating we're upping the ante and yeah. uh but interesting we, yeah uh, yeah i i think i don't think there's going to be a a very simple um conclusion to that war yeah Yeah. um i think it's going to get a a, quite a bit dirtier and uh, uglier i would say before it anything actually comes out of it and unfortunately Um, i don't have any faith in the biden administration to uh, make that situation any better we'll just continue supplying arms until something something somebody nukes something (laughs) i hope it's not a nuke i think it'll be something way before nuke but yeah something will uh Somebody's going to push the line too far, and there's been already, you know, multiple times where, oh, is Russia, you know, pushing the line too far? We just shot a missile into Ukraine and killed a Polish, uh, a Polish citizen. So, um, or yeah, was it's a Polish soldier, but yeah, it's it's a mess. Um, all right, so uh, quick recap um, <clears throat> on George Santos. Politicians aren't known for their honesty. Uh, we're not incredibly shocked he's just a bit more extreme and then on the second one the Biden administration I, I thought it was interesting both of you basically agreed that you don't like the military industrial complex effectively like running our uh, international policy right that basically we have these these resources it drives a big part of the economy and as a result we become the world's police force and fight all of these proxy wars. Um, so there, again, there's agreement, a lot of agreement between the two when we kind of tackle these issues. Uh, any last thoughts that you guys want to add on either of those points? I think, the, I think the majority, I think the majority of Americans would agree in the point that we don't want to be involved in international wars and we'd rather spend our time and our money fixing the problems here in America before we start causing problems elsewhere or supporting other people's problems elsewhere. I think most people would agree on that. Tom, any last thoughts? Well, my only thought I was, I was, when we were discussing, I was thinking like, could we, it would, if we had done nothing, zero involvement with Ukraine, 
how i mean like besides all of the economic sanctions that we did on russia right and and <clears throat> those have had a toll but i think it takes time for that to play out and mm-hmm. i don't know like we just weren't patient enough we wanted to we we had the will of the people so we decided to just to go for it but like could that have worn down like what you want to see happen is like a um you want to see, I think it was like World War One with Germany, where the 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 government just collapses, and the the the, the battle was still like the lines never broke. The German lines never broke. It was like the government collapsed, and it was like, okay, we're done. And mm-hmm. uh, and you, like I think that would be maybe an ideal situation. And it's like, could you economically isolate Russia enough that they would? The problem is that they have so much commodities. Everyone wants their oil, um, right. their and yeah. gas. Yeah, they're oil and gas, exactly. So that makes it hard when when you actually do want the thing that they're selling. Like nobody's mm-hmm. knowing, you know, not many people are buying North Korea's trinkets, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, people do want Russia's stuff. Um, but yeah, I like could that have happened, and and um, I don't know, right? Or would it be just a Crimea thing where it's like, oh, they took Crimea, oh well, well, this, you know, it'd be like, oh, they took the the Donbass, all right, well, okay, fine, take it. Yeah, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of repercussions for that when they did that. Well, and the Donbass region, I mean, there are a couple of regions, right? The I think it's yeah, I'm forgetting both names, but there are like two regions there. One starts with an L, and I want to say like Luhansk, but I, I, it might be wrong. Um, the the tricky part about those two regions is the people <laughs> in those regions of the country. And actually, most Ukrainians do speak Russian, right? But those regions, that's like the primary language. Yeah, and so a lot of the people there do see themselves as Russian. Right. Yeah. Um, so it does complicate it a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, with that particular region. So, I mean, I, I could see potentially some resolution where they're like, okay, you know, you have to cede some of this territory to Russia and then Russia will stop. And maybe at that point, like Ukraine joins NATO, right? Like, okay. Like that's the compromise, right? Like you can't aggress anymore. Mm-hmm. These are Ukrainians. That's you get a little bit of this territory. I, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is because it's, it's messy. And the part that I worry about is how long will the West continue to fund Ukraine in this battle? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, have, have we lost the will in the U S to continue to fight this proxy war? Right. Cause that's what we're doing. We're fighting a proxy war with Russia. Yeah. And Americans love long wars that don't seem to have any end in sight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we got maybe like two months in a three months where we're like, woohoo, Ukraine. And then we're yeah. like, now we're like, oh, that's still going. <laughs> yeah. The new cycle has moved on. It has. Yeah. hundred yeah. <clears throat> percent. Um, interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that, if Russia had gotten something out of it, I know this sounds bad, right? No one wants this, but that would have let Putin save face and could have walked yeah. away with a V, right? And right. Uh, and then he, you know, and maybe this uh, that resolves itself. Maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe it just emboldens him. But but I think, but if, if I think it's like what you said, they would have joined uh, Ukraine, would have joined NATO, mm-hmm. and you would, and you know, all of a sudden, Finland and Sweden probably would have joined regardless right they're joining right. now um or, or at least they're trying to if, yep. if turkey lets them i know um, but uh it's like it, everyone will harden against russia it, it kind of unites everybody mm-hmm. so it's 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 um you know you might get more out of it by not doing anything and just letting russia play its hand uh, right now it's good it's just gonna get ugly but yeah whatever. okay let's wrap it up there um Thanks uh, to our two discussants today, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Catch us on the next one. Uh, Tom, look, we don't always agree when it comes to politics, um, but if there's one thing that we do agree on, it's that there's only one way to clean up after going to the bathroom, and that's with a Lux bidet. Listen, I've been using bidets forever, all right? And Lux is the best, all right? So, I mean, I've got like the little squatty potty thing and the bidet. It's like a whole experience. It's it's actually, it's probably one of the highlights of the entire day. But like, it gets me clean and it gets me ready to uh, talk politics in a civilized manner. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. Um, every time that I use a toilet, it doesn't have a bidet. When I go to a friend's house, you know, I just don't use their toilet, first of all. But uh 
that's about as uncivilized as it gets. So uh, civil conversations demand civil hygiene practices. That's why everyone should get a bidet. And just to be clear, right, we, we want to make, make it clear. Listeners can get their own Lux bidet with 10% off by ordering at luxbidet.com and using our promo code FCBG10, Finding Common Battlegrounds 10. Uh, and the last thing that we want to say, uh, Lux is supporting this podcast. Uh, but they don't side one. They don't support one side or the other. They support civil conversations and clean butts. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Finding Common Battlegrounds. The music is by Ben Sound. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and not those of their employers. For more information or more episodes, you can find us at findingcommonbattlegrounds.com.